Hi, my name is Sarah Craze and I'm a historian and author. The following is a presentation I gave as part of Victorian History Month and it's on Ashburton's Green Spaces. I talk about the history of our parks, how they came about, how they got their names, a few little stories about them and the status of them today. It goes for about 30 minutes, so I hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching. This talk today stems from some of the research I've done for the Willows and I chose it because the history of Ashburton's Green Spaces covers two historical themes that have emerged repeatedly in my research. The long years of neglect Ashburton suffered at the hands of the City of Camberwell Council and the long significance of playing sport in the area. So let's dive in. No history of Ashburton can begin without acknowledging the original owners of Burundara, the Wurundjeri people. The name Burundara came from the rich variety of trees that lined the creek and translates to shady place. For many generations, the Wurundjeri spent their winters on the banks of Kuyongku Creek. And today the creek would be completely unrecognisable to them and is named for the man who usurped them from their land, John Gardner. The Wurundjeri men spent their days hunting kangaroo and wallaby while the women dug out the nutritious murnong roots, pictured here, and collected seeds and eggs along the creek. In 1835, the arrival of John Gardner with his sheep and cattle from New South Wales decimated the delicate environmental balance Wurundjeri maintained along Kuyong Coot within weeks. With their food supply gone, most of the Wurundjeri fled to the, their summer grounds in the Dandenongs or were rounded up and placed in missions. For someone whose name now adorns a street, a church, a creek and a train station, not much is really known about John Gardner. He was certainly wealthy, ambitious and well-connected, but he did not keep a diary and his wife Mary wrote only erratically in hers. Aside from his epic overland trip down from New South Wales, he is most known for allowing his men to shoot at Wurundjeri men stealing potatoes from his field. One of these Wurundjeri was a man called Tullamarine, who escaped to Sydney Lockup, walked 600 kilometres south before he reached the area that is now named for him. To really stick it to John Gardner, Tullamarine got a suburb and an airport named after him. Gardner only stayed in the area for a few years before his marriage turned unhappy, allegedly because of his wife's mental ill health, and he moved to Yarra Glen and then eventually returned to England in 1842. After Gardner's departure, Ashburton became sparsely populated by farms, orchards and market gardens. Some of the streets we know today take their names from the early residents, such as Stocks Avenue, Veer Road and Baker Parade, as a few examples. Many of the landowners allowed their unused paddocks to be used for recreation. An area near the present day Burwood Reserve, known as Fiddler's Green, is believed to be the home ground for the Norwood Cricket Club, a precursor to the Ashburton Willows. The first record of a match played by Norwood is from 1875. Now, this photograph is actually labelled Ashburton, but really, as you can see, it could probably be anywhere, but I'm going to go with it being part of Ashburton. Now, little changed in Ashburton by 1890 until the arrival of the Outer Circle Railway Line and the establishment of Norwood Railway Station. Its name was soon changed to Ashburton. Much has been written about the line, always included with the word ill-fated, so I won't go into it here, but it will become relevant later on. When it comes to Ashburton's history, it's most notable today because one of the parliamentarians who tried to financially exploit the line, James Munro, bought the land around the street that bears his name today, in an attempt to capitalise on his insider knowledge on the construction of the line. Whether he did or not, I don't know, but he did at least finance the building of a couple of the shops in High Street. Before long, it became a popular activity for Melbourne residents to travel by train to Ashburton and picnic in the Ashburton Forest. This was a large wooded area on the south side of High Street. I'm not sure when this picture was taken, but I believe it's closer to the 1930s because those little dots right there at the bottom are actually cars. And a lot of the original forest would have already been cleared by then. Ashburton Forest was owned by Michael Monane. This is a very bad picture of him, I do apologise. It's the only one I could find. Although he lived in West East Melbourne, where he ran his law practice, he and his brother Patrick owned much of the land in the area. As housing began to encroach on Ashburton Forest from the 1920s, a public push to save the forest began. This included the purchase of the forest to create a national or state park, with the extension of the High Street tram from Glen Iris bundled in with it. 
Mornane offered the land to Camberwell Council, but they could not agree on a price. Gradually, the land was subsumed by developers. For a while, Mr Mornane operated a golf course on a section of it close to High Street. Then, towards the end of his life, he offered a section of it to the new St Michael's Catholic Church for a school. He placed a condition on it that his donation was not made public until after his death. St Michael's Parish School sits on Mr Monane's land today. A very small remnant of the forest survives today near Markham Estate and on Welfare Parade. It is lovingly cared for by the friends of Ashburton Forest. Now this is a shortened map of Mornane's land from 1886. That is the earliest I can find from this time. And this is thanks to the excellent work of a Hawthorne-based historian called Gwen McWilliam. It's cut off a bit here, but you can see that although Gardner's name is on the creek at the top there, <clears throat> it's still also being referred to as Kuyong Coot. You can also see where I've circled the Sherwood Park Racing Club. And it's an approximate location probably between Liston Street and Norwood Road, which is Turak Road today. This was a large paddock owned by Mr J.B. Scott. He ran it as a race course and by 1893 it was apparently a very pleasant buggy ride from Camberwell to watch the horses and have a flutter. But alas, it only lasted a few years because by 1895 the Victorian Racing Club had decided to centralise Melbourne racing and hold more of it at Flemington. Sherwood was still used for athletics and cricket until Mr Scott sold the land to a Morven grocer called Mr James Lindsay in 1897 and there is now no trace of it surviving. The first land purchased by the council specifically for recreation in the area was Burwood Reserve in 1907. This was an initiative organised by the residents who lived around the reserve and had already been using it for sport and recreation for several decades. They presented their local city of Camberwell councillor, Frederick Veer, with a petition asking the council to purchase the land on their behalf. In return, they proposed paying for the fencing and clearing the land themselves. Councillor Veer supported the idea at council and got them to agree to seek the funds from the state government, who then said that they will give them the money on the condition that they also purchased the piece of land adjacent called Fiddler's Green. This was duly done and this land is what we know as today as Burwood Reserve. As far as the council was concerned, maintaining Burwood Reserve was now the responsibility of its local residents. The Reserves Committee of Management then spent the next 30 years begging and pleading for council funds to help them maintain the fences, the cricket pitch and a pavilion. As we will see, this attitude from council was prevalent across the whole of the section of its jurisdiction that covered Burwood, Hartwell, Ashburton and Glen Iris, known as South Ward. Nothing much happened in Ashburton until well after World War I when the first housing boom began. The former farms were being bought up, bundled into estates and sold off in subdivisions. This was occurring across the whole of the city of Camberwell. But the problem for Ashburton was that it did not have the sewerage and drainage infrastructure in place to manage such fast paced development. The council was certainly investing in other areas of green space across its jurisdiction, but little of its funds were coming to Ashburton for anything at all, let alone parkland. Ashburton suffered from a case of what many newspaper correspondents and several councillors at the time called civic neglect. And this situation essentially lasted well into the 1960s. But back in 1924, thanks to the efforts of Councillor Veer, a tranche of land on the corner of High Street and Veer's Road was purchased by the City of Camberwell for a park in Ashburton. Those matching names are not a coincidence. As was very common at the time, I've no doubt Councillor Veer personally benefited from the Council's decision. The purchase of this land marks the start of the Ashburton we know today, but unfortunately, much like at Burwood Reserve, the park was left to its own devices. Though the park had its own committee to advocate for it, the residents of Ashburton at the time were still trying to get sewerage and drainage to their properties, so park maintenance was not a high priority. The Ashburton Cricket Club begged for council funds to at least put a fence around the park to stop horses and cows and sheep wandering through cricket matches, but this was not successful either. Until 1934, Ashburton Park lay vacant and derelict. Unlike Ashburton Park, the Hartwell Sports Ground came about in 1926 thanks to lobbying a lobbying campaign from the Hartwell Progress Association. For those who don't know, Progress Associations were grassroots organisations of local residents dedicated to lobbying the powers that be for civil improvements. 1920s Melbourne was a time when the socio-economic demographic of the people who were buying land was very different from even the generation before. 
Yet the people in positions of power were in the same socio-economic demographic that had run Melbourne for decades. They were people of wealth and influence, not used to being challenged by their lower classes. There was power in organisation, and that is what the Progress Associations were for. Having observed the struggles of the Burwood and Ashburton residents to develop their green spaces, the Hartwell residents took a very different path. They reasoned that if they could immediately present the council with a purpose for the land, namely to play the two most popular sports of the time, cricket and Australian rules football, then the council would have to fund the development of it. This strategy worked. Before long, the Hartwell Cricket Club had designated the Hartwell Sports Ground as its new home ground and set about raising funds for a cricket pitch. Within a few years, fencing and a pavilion followed. In 1934, as Melbourne suffered through the Great Depression, a significant ideological change occurred to the City of Camberwell Council. The old Conservative Guard had finally retired and given way to a new, still Conservative, but younger generation of councillors. They had names you may be familiar with, Nettleton, Watson, Warner and Raven among them. These men recognised that in a time of despair, sport can offer hope to dispirited people. So they began to invest considerably more council funds into the green spaces of the area. Now don't get me wrong, there were still, these were still weighted heavily in Camberwell's favour, but Ashburton Park managed to secure £125 for park improvements. Six months later, after criticism from the Ashburton Progress Association about how Camberwell Sports Ground got a whole new pavilion and they got a measly £125, council found an additional £500 for them. These funds were spent on grass, fencing and tree planting at, at the north and south ends. In a shrewd move, the Ashburton Park Committee named the new tra tree plantations Warner Plantation North and Warner Plantation South after the man who had supplied the trees, Councillor William Warner. He was also a well-known horticulturalist who owned a nursery in Burwood Road, Auburn. In fact, Councillor Warner supplied almost every street tree in the whole of Camberwell and should take some credit for putting the leafy part into the leafy eastern suburbs. Ashburton residents were learning that if you name your park or something in it after a councillor, you're more likely to get the funds you need from the council in a more timely manner. Warner Reserve and Watson Park are a case in point. Let's start with Warner Reserve. In a rare forward-thinking move by the council, the land for Warner Reserve was purchased by council in 1933. Since Councillor Warner had only been elected to council a year earlier, the naming of the reserve most likely connected to how he donated 40 trees for its landscaping. The original land stretched all the way to High Street and was intended to provide an oval, three tennis courts, eight lawn bowling rinks and a children's playground. At the northern end, where the Ashburton Senior Centre stands today, was the first of a series of RSL clubs. Within the next decade, Ashburton entered into another significant stage of housing development. This was the establishment of the Housing Commission estate on the south side of High Street. Houses were being built at a rapid pace all around Warner Reserve, so it would become a significant re recreation area for the new residents. Eventually, the Ashburton Lawn Bowls Club opened in 1950, and then in 1962, the Camberwell South Swimming Pool. Watson Park also took its name from a recently elected councillor. In 1937, Councillor D.W. Watson suggested purchasing a tranche of land between Munro Avenue and Dent Street. It was promptly named Watson Park and had its pavilion and toilets up and ready in record time for an official opening on the 30th of October 1937. This is before Ashburton Parks Committee had managed to even acquire funding for a pavilion. Councillor Watson may well have quickly regretted having his name attached to the marshy bog that Watson Park became every winter. Inadequate drainage and sewage leakage was a persistent problem for the park. Decades later, many a parent lamented their child dropping their mouth guard into the mud of Watson Park and then popping it back into their mouth. Buoyed by his success getting Watson Park up and running, Council Watson decided to take over the management of the Ashburton Park Committee too. The council minutes from this time indicate there were problems with this committee, but they don't elaborate on what they were. With Councillor Watson in charge, a pavilion was up in no time. Ashburton School began using the ground for football and by 1940, the first cricket practice nets were erected. The new pavilion became the home of the first community kindergarten in Ashburton and op that opened in 1945. The new Housing Commission estate caused a massive influx of new residents, predominantly families with young children, and Ashburton's education facilities could not keep up. 
the schools quickly filled up and suffered from severe overcrowding. Preschool education was limited to playgroups in church halls. So in 1945, local residents Mr and Mrs Incole mobilised the local community into creating a community kindergarten at Ashburton Park. A portion of the sports oval and room in the pavilion became devoted to the children. In the spirit of post-war frugality, everything for the new kindergarten was made by parents from waste material from the army reclamation dump at Fisherman's Bend. A playhouse was even made from munitions cases. This became the first playground in Ashburton. The kindergarten was an instant hit, paying off its debts within two years. It became a model for community-led kindergartens across Melbourne. In 1950, the Kindergarten Committee was able to purchase its own land, community kindergartens in Ashburton. At the time, Rowan Street Kinder was something of an anomaly in Ashburton. It took until well into the 1960s and the machinations of a certain Ashburton resident called Neville Lee for the council to free up funds to support preschool education in the area, down on Rowan Street. Two years later, and nearly 70 years ago this year, the new Rowan Street Kindergarten held its first Christmas fair. Although there are now several... On the 15th of September 1944, Mr G. H. Burroughs founded Ashburton's Scout Troop. The initial venue was the Ashburton Recreation Pavilion on High Street, but the building of a scout hall was an early consideration of the troop's parents and friends committee. In 1946, it was proposed to be located in the northwest corner of Ashburton Park. For those directionally challenged like me, this is the Fackenham Road side of the park. This idea went down so badly that there was a protest organised by the residents of Fackenham Road. Their objections sound, well, you know, pretty much like all the objections of every landowner ever who doesn't like development or change anywhere near their land. And these included, when purchasing land opposite the reserve, they did not anticipate a hall being built immediately opposite. Past experience had shown that scout halls, as built in other districts, deteriorated to such an extent that the modern homes opposite depreciated in value. The noise coming from the hall would constitute a common nuisance and halls other than buildings for sport facilities should not be erected on public reserve. So Councillor Eric Raven suggested that perhaps a new scout hall which could be built on the high street side of the reserve and it remains there still in pretty good shape today. The 1950s was a time when Ashburton's sporting culture was at its peak. The suburbs supported four cricket clubs, a very successful Australian rules football club, a tennis club and a lawn bowls club. But since this was the 1950s and not today, every so often a councillor appeared on record suggesting perhaps the grass at Ashburton Park should be mowed before the summer because the children would soon start playing with matches and it would minimise the risk of fire. Kids causing trouble at Ashburton Park was a popular theme in the local Ashburton newspaper, the Progress Press. On one side were the cohort of adults complaining about teenagers and their laziness and on the other was a cohort suggesting that if there was more for them to do in the area, perhaps they'd stop loitering about around milk bars and vandalising the parks. While flying model aeroplanes at Ashburton Park seems a rather benign activity now, the sensitive residents of Fackenham Road could not abide it. Having successfully ensured the scout hall would be less of a bother to them, they set about complaining about the noise from the boys' aeroplanes, particularly on a Sunday, but more about that in a moment. Just so happened that one of the City of Camberwell councillors lived on Fackenham Road and he used his influence to push through a bylaw prohibiting the flying of model aeroplanes on all local parks except the one furthest away from his house, Greythorn Park up in North Baldwin. This was far too far for a teenage boy to take his plane on his bike and so yet more boys began loitering around milk bars and vandalising parks around the neighbourhood. Meanwhile over in Glen Iris, residents also suffered from the same civic neglect as Ashburton. Glen Iris Park at Kuyongkut Creek was purchased in 1926 and the usual battle for funds began. The Glen Iris Cricket Club tried to surreptitiously get council to fund a pavilion under the disguise of a war memorial, but it didn't work. The rest of the land along the creek lay unused paddocks for several decades. Conversely, the land on the other side of Kuyongkut Creek that fell under the jurisdiction of the Morven Council had been long developed as sports ground some years earlier. This area would become the heartland of the battleground against the extension of the South Eastern Freeway in the 1970s and 80s. Back in 1975, two tranches of land were purchased and named for Dorothy Laver, who was the first woman elected to Camberwell Council. In 1973, she became the first female mayor. Dorothy Laver took the naming of the land after her quite seriously, and in 1983, she helped the Camberwell Lacrosse Club obtain council funds to develop the paddocks as home grounds for themselves. 
The land on the hill up to High Street, adjacent to Glen Iris Park, was named Eric Raven Reserve, while the man himself still sat on Camberwell Council. Of all the men and one woman who had a park in Ashburton or Glen Iris named after them, it is, in my opinion, Eric Raven who most deserved this honour. And I'm not sure how that translated into that ugly, weird-looking gate thing that he's got going on there, but bear with me while I tell you a story of how this unassuming man went into battle for our democratic rights. Much like all the other Camberwell councillors, Eric Raven was a conservative man. He was a Christian and a staunch supporter of the dry area bylaws. Elected to council in 1938, you may think that because he remained on council for over 30 years that he didn't like change, but you'd be wrong. Back before the Second World War, there was a widespread principle in place in Australia called Sunday observance. This essentially meant Sundays were set aside for church and rest, unless you're a woman who still had to do all the cooking and the cleaning up. This principle was entrenched in council bylaws that prohibited the use of green spaces for recreation and organised sport on Sundays. Now everyone knows that getting councils to change bylaws is no walk in a park. Nevertheless, after the war, a number of councils began bowing to pressure from their constituents to abolish the Sunday observance prohibitions. The primary reason for this was practical. People were ignoring them anyway and not having toilet facilities open on council parks and recreations areas was creating a sanitary nightmare. This initiative arrived in, in Camberwell in 1947, yet its residents voted no to changing the bylaws. Now voting was in no way compulsory and estimates came in that only 20% of the residents voted anyway, so it was hardly representative of the views of the population. But it was representative of the views of one highly influential Ashburton man, W. Gordon Sprigg. Sprigg was the honorary chair of the Sunday Observance Council and it was his mission in life to ensure that not only should no one work for money on Sundays, nobody should do anything but go to church on Sunday. Fundraising for orphan children? No. Entertaining war veterans? No way. Thinking of having a friendly footy game on a Sunday? Absolutely not on your life. And I know all this because Sprigg was a prolific letter writer to the Age and the Argus. And so his seething resentment at the growing changes to the Sunday observance rules is all there in black and white. As Melbourne councils all began to overturn their bylaws against sport on Sunday, Sprigg dug in. He made it his mission in life to ensure that nobody was elected to Camberwell Council who supported overturning the ban. For over a decade, he exerted his influence to ensure that despite a growing push for change and increasing levels of teenage delinquency on Sundays, that ban in Camberwell was going to be abolished over his dead body. Eventually, in 1959, it took a sustained campaign from the youth Christian workers, who were all boys, and local sporting clubs to push for a new referendum on the Sunday sport ban in Camberwell. They argued that vandalism and delinquency were at their worst on Sunday afternoons because Camberwell youth were not permitted to use their energy for healthy recreation. Sprigg's no advocates on council dragged their feet at the referendum, arguing over whether it should be a postal vote or a proper poll and whether it should cover non-commercial sport. Eventually, thanks in no small part to the advocacy of Eric Raven, the referendum went ahead. It came back with a three to one yes vote in favour of abolishing the ban. The result stunned the Camberwell councillors. Nobody saw it coming. Now you would think that such a resounding democratic answer for everyone to be allowed to play sport on Sunday would be sufficient to change the bylaws, but you'd be dead wrong. Two months later, the shocked council came back with their plan for how Sunday sport would work in Camberwell. Sunday sport could only be played in the afternoon between 1pm and 6pm so it did not interfere with church attendance. Not only that, but only the quiet sports of tennis and lawn bowls would be allowed to be played and only every other week. Cricket could only be played on council reserves on one afternoon per month. Football, not at all. Now it was the turn of the sporting clubs of Camberwell to be shocked. As far as they were concerned, the referendum was a waste of time and money in the flouting of ratepayers' democratic rights. They were furious. So was Gordon Sprigg. He was rallying against the erosion of the proper observance of the Christian Sunday. By this time, even archbishops were on record saying they enjoyed a game of cricket on Sunday. Enter Eric Raven. It was his opinion that despite his deeply held religious views, what an individual did on a Sunday was their personal choice. I suspect he surreptitiously encouraged various clubs to lobby the council for the right to play on Sundays. Over the next five years, he would table their letters requesting to play, move a motion to have it read, would then be seconded by his ally, Councillor Neville Lee, 
only to be knocked back time and again by Sprigg's men on council. It seemed the only way through really was to wait for Sprigg to die. And eventually, in 1963, at the ripe old age of 93, he finally did. With Sprigg's stranglehold on council elections finally gone, now Raven had to wait for sufficient churn to occur for new, more progressive men to be elected. In 1965, clutching the annual letter he received from Camberwell Football Club asking to play on Sunday, Raven finally managed to push through a small nudge to the bylaws against football. The club could now play on one Sunday a month. Meanwhile, the rule restricting tennis, golf and lawn bowls was also gradually loosening. By Camberwell Football Club's 1967 season, eight years after the referendum, enough of a churn had occurred on council that Raven was finally able to push through permission for football to be played on Sundays. This was not a moment too soon, as the club was facing a serious threat for playing space from soccer. So next time you pass Eric Raven's weird gate thing down there on High Street, and remember that it's because of him that our democratic rights as residents were upheld. The last park developed in the area was the one that affords Ashburton the mantle of the most green space in Burundara. But did you know that it used to be a rubbish dump? That's why Markham Reserve is primarily comprised of grass, because trees won't easily grow on it. Back when the Housing Commission was building the estate, this expanse was used as a dumping ground for household waste, construction materials and an extraordinary number of old cars. In some places, the landfill was at least 10 metres deep. Then sometime in the 1960s, rather than remove the landfill, the council dumped a layer of sand and clay over the top. This was not done in any kind of engineered way. So whenever heavy rain fell, the water soaked through. As a result, the methane gas levels generated by the rubbish underneath contaminated the soil and most likely the air around it. This restricted the growth of trees and allowed only grass to grow. The haphazard nature of the filling in of the dump also made the surface of the reserve far too unstable to build reliable pavements and structures. For decades, the fundamental settlement problems of Markham Reserve meant it was used for passive recreation only. In summer, when there was less chance of rain, cricket was played at the Oval on the western end. However, winter sports teams were very reluctant to play there as it could not be certain what might emerge in the soil after rain. Sometime around 1984, an idea emerged to create a linear park along the path of the abandoned outer circle line. My research so far has only covered the railway, which is very well documented, so for this presentation I had a poke around on how the park was formed. And there's surprisingly little public information about it, but it appears that residents in Murrumbina were the first to take credit for pushing the idea in any kind of organised way. At the time, local residents already around the old line already used the vacant land as parkland, and most of it was maintained at the expense of councils, including Camberwell, Kew, Malvern and Caulfield. Small sections of it leased to various commercial, residential, government and municipal bodies, with most of it already owned by the state government. It was already possible to travel from one end of the park to the other on foot, but the idea for the park involved sealing and paving much of the pathway to allow bicycle travel. Ashburton Station was one of the few stations along the original outer circle line still in operation, so Ashburton formed an important historical link to the Linear Park project. There was also significant indigenous vegetation along the line to preserve. The queue section was officially opened in 1991, and I'm assuming this is the section to East Malvern, but if anyone else knows, I'm still trying to work all of that out. In the mid-1990s, Camberwell Council were amalgamated with Hawthorne and Kew to become Burundara Council. This was part of a massive set of reforms implemented by the Kennett government across Victoria. He sacked 1,600 elected councils and replaced them with hand-picked commissioners. A century of boundaries were torn apart when 210 municipalities became 78. Although Burwood was lost to Monash, Ashburton and Glen Iris remained with Burundara. Kennett's reforms were highly controversial. Residents were now customers and councillors were expected to keep out of day-to-day -day council affairs, especially planning. This was the domain of the chief executives, who now engaged in competitive tendering processes over providing council funds. Plenty of people have opinions on whether it's better now than it was before or not, so I won't go into that debate, but it does seem that Ashburton did benefit with more council attention than it had attracted before. One of the first areas to receive council support was Markham Reserve. The new super council supported a comprehensive plan to improve the grassed areas already prepared. By this time, increased environmental awareness showed that putting a rubbish dump right near a waterway and a housing estate was perhaps not such a good idea. The reserve has been improved consistently into the 21st century, 
were the connecting path to the Gardens Creek Trail and the Outer Circle Line Anniversary Trail, a new playground, solar lighting along the walkway and plans for a dog park. Burundau Council also supports the work of the Friends of Ashburton Forest in preserving the last of the forest historic trees on Markham Reserve. The newest green space in Ashburton is the Winton Road Food Forest. The food forest stemmed from a grant awarded to the Craig Family Centre in 2011. Long-term Ashburton resident Petra Carl proposed to use her years of expertise in permaculture to establish a food forest. This is a system of gardening based on sustainable and organic principles that uses carefully selected perennial plants that complement and support each other. This approach helps minimise weeds, pests and maintenance while also providing a rich variety of harvests. By 2017, thanks to the hard work of Petra and a dedicated group of volunteers, the forest grew sufficient produce to encourage community engagement through food swaps and working bees. In 2013, Burundara Council invested considerably in improving its parks and recreation facilities, with new cricket nets at Hartwell and Ashburton, an impressive pavilion at Burwood Reserve, among other improvements. Burwood Reserve is today the home of the Ashy Redbacks Junior Football Club, among others and the commencement of the AFLW in 2017 caused a significant influx of girls into the club, requiring improvements to facilities that cater to their needs. Unfortunately, Ashburton's Park's pavilion is looking a little tired by comparison, so hopefully it will be upgraded one day soon, maybe in time for its centenary anniversary. So in conclusion, I wanted to point out that I haven't touched too much on the creation of playgrounds because that's like a whole other really big topic, but I also want to acknowledge that there is an extraordinary culture of grassroots support for preserving Ashburton's green spaces. If you are interested in getting involved, please go to the internet or Facebook and have a look for those groups.